open your ears. Or which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post horse, still unfold the acts commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, the which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumor, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defense, whilst the big year, swollen with some other griefs, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war and no such matter. Rumour is a pipe blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant wavering multitude can play upon it. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumour here? I run before King Harry's victory, who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion even with the rebels' blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king before the Douglas rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumoured through the peasant towns, between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone, where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learnt of me. From rumours' tongues they bring smooth comforts false, worse than true wrongs. Who keeps the gate here, ho? Oh, where is the Earl? What shall I say you are? Tell thou the Earl that the Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. His Lordship has walked forth into the orchard. Please it, Your Honour, knock but at the gate, and he himself will answer. Here comes the Earl. Odd news, Lord Bardolph. Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention like a horse full of high feeding madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, I bring you sudden news from Shrewsbury. Lord and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death, uh, and in the fortune of my lord, your son, Prince Harry, is slain outright, and both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth's brawn, the hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, Came not till now to dignify the times in Caesar's fortune. How oh, is this derived? Saw you the field. Came you from Shrewsbury? I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence. A gentleman, well-bred and of good name, that freely render me these news for true. Uh, here comes my servant Travers, whom I sent on Tuesday last to listen after news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he haply may retail from me. Now, Travers, what good tidings comes from you? My lord, Sir John Amfreville turned me back with joyful tidings, and being better horsed out, rode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his bloodied horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. He told me that rebellion had ill luck, and that young Harry Percy's spur was cold. With that, he gave his able horse the head, and bending forward, struck his armed heels against the panting sides of his poor jade up to the rowel head. And starting so, he seemed in running to devour the way, staying no longer question. Again, said he, young Harry Percy's spur was cold, of hot spur, cold spur, but rebellion had met ill luck. My lord, I'll tell you what. If my young lord, your son, have not the day upon mine honour for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. Why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? Who he? He was some hilding fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke an adventure. Look, here comes more news. Uh. This man's brow, like to a title leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. So looks the strand, whereon the imperious flood hath left a witnessed usurpation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrewsbury? I ran from Shrewsbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. Uh, how doth my son, my brother, thou tremblest, and the 
whiteness in thy cheek is apt to thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead in look, so woe begone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night and would have told him half his Troy was burned. But Priam found the fire ere he his tongue, and I, my Percy's death, ere thou reportst it. This thou wouldst say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus, so fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast to sigh, to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living, and your brother yet, but for my lord, your son. Why, he's dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eyes, that what he feared is chanced. But speak, Morton. Tell thou an earl his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace, and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me gainsaid. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakes thy head and holdst it fear or sin to speak a truth. If it be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death, and he doth sin and doth belie the dead. Not he which says the dead is not alive. Yet the first bringer of unwelcome news hath but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after as a sullen bell, remembered, knowing a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord, your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these mine eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreathed to Harry Monmouth, whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In few his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, being brooted once, took fire and heat away from the best-tempered courage in his troops. For from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. And as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greatest speed, so did our men, heavy and hot spurs lost, lend to this weight such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester too soon ta'en prisoner. And that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, gan veil his stomach, and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. The sum of all is that the king hath won, and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. Uh, for this I shall have time enough to mourn. In poison, there is physic, and these news Having been well, it would have made me sick. Being sick have in some measure made me well. And as the wretch whose fever weakened joints, like strengthless hinges, buckle under life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms, even so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch, my scaly gauntlet now, with joints of steel must glove this hand. And hence, thou sickly quaff, thou art a guard too wanton for the head which princes fleshed with conquest aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron and approach the raggedest hour that time and spite dare bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth. Now let not nature's hand keep the wild flood confined. Let order die. And let this world no longer be a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. This strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honour. The lives of all your loving complices lean on your health, the which, if you give o'er to stormy passion, must perforce decay. You cast the event of war, my noble lord, and summed the accompt of chance before you said, let us make head. 
It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. You knew he walked off perils on an edge more likely to fall in than to get o'er. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars, and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged. Yet did you say, go forth. And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What hath then befallen, or what hath this bold enterprise brought forth, more than that being which was like to be? We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought out life, twas ten to one. And yet we ventured for the gain proposed, choked the respect of likely peril feared, and since we are our set, venture again. Come, we will all put forth, body and goods. Tis more than time. And my most noble lord, I hear for certain, and do speak the truth, the gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My lord, your son, had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. For that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls, and they did fight with queasiness, constrained as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side. But for their spirits and souls, this word rebellion, it had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to religion. Suppose sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind, and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause, Tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land, gasping for life under great Bolingbroke, and more and less do flock to follow him. I knew of this before, but to speak truth, this present grief had wiped it from my mind. Go in with me, and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters, and make friends with speed. Never so few, and never yet more need. itself was a good healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish compounded clay, man, is not able to invent anything that tends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath o'erwhelmed all her litter but one. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, why then I've no judgment. Thou whores and mandrake, thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never man with an agate till now, but I will set you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel and send you back again to your master for a jewel. The juvenile, the prince your master, whose chin is not yet fledged, I will sooner have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he shall get one on his cheek. Yet he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will, it is not a hair amiss yet. He may keep it still at a face royal, for a barber shall never earn sixpence out of it. And yet he'll be crowing as if he had writ man ever since his father was a bachelor. He may keep his own grace, but he's almost out of mine, I can assure him. What said Master Dumbledore about the satin for my short cloak and slops? He said, sir, you should procure him better assurance than Bardolph. He would not take his bond and yours. He liked not the security. Let him be damned like the glutton. May his tongue be hotter. A horse and a hitofell. A rascally yea forsooth knave to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. For whores and smooth pates do now wear nothing but high shoes and bunches of keys at their girdles. And if a man is through with them in all his taking up, then they must stand upon security. At his leaf they put rat's bane in my mouth as often to stop it with security. I looked he should have sent me two and twenty yards of satin, as I'm a true knight, 
and he sent me security. Well, he may sleep in security, for he hath the hall of abundance, and the likeness of his wife shines through it, and yet cannot he see, though he have his own lanthorn, to light him. Where's Bardolf? He's gone into Smithfield to buy a worship a horse. Ho! Oh, I bought him in Paul's, and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. If I could get me a wife in the stews, I were man, horsed, and wived. Sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince for striking him about Bardolf. Wait close, I will not see him. What's he that goes there? Full staff, and please your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery? He, my lord. But he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and, as I hear, is now going with some charge the Lord John of Lancaster. What, to York? Call him back again. Sir John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I'm deaf. You must speak louder. My master is deaf. I'm sure he is for the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. Uh, Sir John. Well, a young knave and beg? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Doth not the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? Though it be a shame to be on any side but one, it is worse shame to beg than to be on the worst side, were it worse than the name of rebellion can tell how to make it. You mistake me, sir. Why, sir? Did I say you were an honest man? Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I had lied in my throat if I'd said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and your soldiership aside and give me leave to tell you you lie in your throat if you say I am any other than an honest man. I give thee leave to tell me so. I lay aside that which grows to me. If thou gettest any leave of me, hang me. If thou takest leave, thou had better be hanged. Your hunt counter, hence a vaunt. Sir, my lord would speak with you. Sir John Falstaff, a word with you. Oh, <laughs> my good lord. God give your lordship good time of day. I'm glad to see your lordship abroad. I heard say your lordship was sick. I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, hath yet some smack of age in you, some relish of the saltness of time. And I most humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverend care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. If it please your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. Mm. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness is fallen into this same horse and apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray let me speak with you. And this apoplexy is, as I take it, a kind of uh, lethargy, a uh, sleeping of the blood, a uh, uh, horse and tingling. What tell you me of it, be it as it is? It hath its original from much grief, from study and perturbation of the brain. I have read the cause of his effects in Galen. It is a kind of deafness. I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Oh, very well, my lord, very well. Uh, rather than please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking that I am troubled with all. To punish you by the heels would amend the attention of your ears, and I cannot if I be your physician. I am as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty. But how I should be your patient to follow your prescriptions, the wise may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed a scruple itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel in the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. <laughs> he that buckles him in my belt cannot live in less. Your means is very slender and your waist great. And would it were otherwise? I wouldn't. My means were greater and my waist slenderer. You have misled the youthful prince. The young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly and he my dog. Well, I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gad's Hill. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or posting that action. My lord. But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not a sleeping wolf. To wake a wolf is as bad as to smell a fox. Ah, here is a candle, the better part burnt out. A wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. 
If I did say of wax, my growth would approve the truth. There's not a white hair on your face, but should have his effect of gravity. His effect of gravy, gravy, gravy. You follow the young prince up and down like his evil angel. Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light. But I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. And yet, in some respects, I grant I cannot go. I, I cannot tell. Virtue is of so little regard in these costermongers' times that true valour is turned bareherd. Pregnancy is made a tapster and hath his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts are pertinent to man, as the malice of this age shapes them, are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old, consider not the capacities of us that are young. You measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your gauze. And we that are in the favour of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. What? Do you set down your name in the scroll of youth that are written down old with all the characters of age? Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand, a yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity? And will you call yourself young? Fie, 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 Sir John. My lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something around belly. For my voice, I have lost it with hallowing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth, father, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. And he that will keep her with me for a thousand marks, let him lend me the money and have at him. For the box of the ear that the prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it. And the young lion repents. Marry, not in ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. Well, God send the prince a better companion. God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king has severed you and Prince Harry. I hear you're going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yes. I thank your pretty sweet wit for it. But look, you pray, all you that kiss my lady peace at home, that our armies join not in a hot day. For by the Lord, I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day, if I brandish anything but my bottle, would I might never spit white again. There is not a dangerous action can peep out his head, but I am thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last ever, but it was always yet the trick of our English nation, if they have a good thing to make it too common. If you will need say I am an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Well, be honest, be honest, and God bless your expedition. Will your lordship lend me a thousand pound to furnish me forth? Not a penny, not a penny. You are too impatient to bear crosses. Fare you well. Commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. If I do, fillip me with a three-man beetle. A man can no more separate age and covetousness than he can part young limbs and lechery. But the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other, and so both the degrees prevent my curses. Boy! Sir? What money's in my purse? Uh, seven groats and two pence. Oh. I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out, but the disease is incurable. Go, bear this letter to my Lord of Lancaster, uh, this to the Prince, this to the Earl of Westmoreland, and this to old Mistress Ursula, whom I have weakly sworn to marry since I perceived the first white hair on my chin. About it, you know where to find me? Oh. Pox of this gout, or a gout of this pox, for the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe. It's no matter if I do halt. I have the walls for my colour, and my pension shall seem the more reasonable. <laughs> a good wit will make use of anything. 
I will turn diseases to commodity. Thus have you heard our causes and known our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all, speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. Uh, first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I will allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how, in our means, we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the King. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and twenty thousand men of choice, and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland, whose bosom burns with an insensate fire of injuries. The question then, Lord Hastings, standeth thus. Whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland? With him we may. I marry, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, Conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids in certain should not be admitted. It is very true, Lord Barnold, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. Mm, it was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself with project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and so with great imagination uh, proper to madmen, led his powers to death and winking leapt into destruction. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods and forms of hope. Yes, if this prescient quality of war induced the instant action, a cause on foot lives so in hope as in early spring we see the appearing buds, which to prove fruit, hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model. And when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find outweighs ability, what do we then but draw anew the model in fewer offices, or at least assist to build at all? Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation in the model, consent upon a sure foundation, question surveyors, know our own estate, how able such a work to undergo to wear against his opposite, or else we fortify in paper and in figures using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it, who half through gives o'er, and leaves his part created cost a naked subject to the weeping clouds, and waste for churlish winter's tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be still born, and that we now possess the utmost man of expectation, I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What, is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us, no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Bardolph. For his three divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French, and one against Glendower. The force of third must take up us. So is the unfirm king in three divided, and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. That he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not be dreaded. If he should do so, he leaves his back unarmed, the French and Welsh baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Mm. Uh, who is it like should lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland, against the Welsh himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French, I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice. Their over-greedy love hath surfeited. An habitation, giddy and unsure, hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O oh, thou fond many, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing Bolingbroke, before he was what thou wouldst have him be. And being now trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard, 
And now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up and howls to find it. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die are now become enamoured on his grave. Thou that threwst dust upon his goodly head when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of Bolingbroke, criest now, O earth, yield us that king again, and take thou this, O thoughts of men accursed. Past and to come seems best, things present worst. Shall we go draw our numbers and set on? We are time's subjects, and time bids be gone. Master Fang, have you entered the action? It is entered. Oh, where's your yeoman? Is it a lusty yeoman? Will he stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, aye, good Master Snare. Here, here. Snare, we must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Aye, good Master Snare. I've entered him and all. It may chance cost some of us our lives. He will stab. Alas the day. Take heed of him. He stabbed me in my own house. And that most beastly in good faith. He cares not what mischief he doth. If his weapon be out, he will foil like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can close with him, I care not for his thrust. No, nor I neither. I bet your elbow. If I but fist him once, if he come but within me vice. I am undone with this going. I warrant he is an infinitive thing upon my score. Good Master Fang, hold him sure. Good Master Snare, let him not scape. He comes continually to Pie Corner, saving your manhoods, to buy a saddle, and is indicted to dinner to the lover's head in Lombard Street, to Master Smooths, the silkman. I pray you, since my action is entered, and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought in to his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear. And I have borne and borne and borne, and have been fobbed off and fobbed off from this day to that day, that it is a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in such dealing, unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast, to bear every knave wrong. Oh, yonder he comes, and that arrant marms he knows barred off with him. <laughs> do your offices, do your offices, Master Fang, and Master Snare, do me, do me, do your offices. Oh, no, <laughs> whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Sir John, I arrest you at the suit of mistress quickly. Away, farlots! Draw barred off! Hey, hey, cut me off the villain's head! Hey, Throw the queen in the channel! Throw me in the channel! Sir John, what are you brawling here? Doth this become your place, your time and business? You should have been well on your way to York. Stand from him, fellow. Wherefore hangst upon him? Oh, my most worshipful lord, and please your grace, I'm a poor widow of East Cheap, and he's arrested at my suit. For what sum? It is more than for some, my lord, it is for all. All I have. He hath eaten me out of house and home, yet put all my substance into that fat belly of his. But I will have some of it out again, or I will ride the knights like the mare. I think I am as like to ride the mare, if I have an advantage round to get up. How comes this, Sir John? Fie! What man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course, to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Mary, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblin, sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a seacoal fire, on Wednesday in Whitsome Week, when the prince broke thy head for likening him to a singing man of Windsor, thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me, and make me my lady thy wife. Canst thou deny it? Did not good wife Keach, the butcher's wife, come in then, and call me gossip quickly, coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar? 
telling us she had a good dish of prawns, whereby thou didst desire to eat some, whereby I told thee they were ill for a green wound. And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire me to be no more familiar with such poor people, saying that ere long they should call me madam? And didst thou not kiss me, and bid me fetch thee thirty shillings? I put thee now to thy book, oath, deny it if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul, and she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. She hath been in good case, and the truth is, poverty has distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I'm well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. It's not a confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from a level consideration. I know you have practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve your uses, both in purse and in person. Yes, in close, my lord. Prithee, peace. Pay her the debt you owe her, and unpay the villainy you've done her. The one you may do with sterling money, and the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. You call honourable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will courtesy and say nothing, he's virtuous. No, my lord my humble duty remembered, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I desire deliverance from these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy the poor woman. Come hither, hostess. Now, Master Gass, mm. what news? The king, my lord, and Henry, Prince of Wales, are near at hand. The rest, the paper tells. Yes, I am a gentleman. Faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman, come no more words of it. By this heavenly ground I tread on, I must be fain to pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses, glasses is the only drinking. And for thy walls, a pretty slight drollery, or the story of the prodigal, or the German hunting and waterwork is worth a thousand of these bed hangings and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound, if thou canst. Come, if it were not for thy humours, there's not a better wench in England. Go, wash thy face and draw thy axe and come. Thou must not be in this humour with me. Come, I know thou was set on to this. Oh, prithee, Sir John, let it be but twenty nobles, if faith. A loath to pawn me plain, so God save me, love. Let it alone. I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Well, you shall have it, although I pawn me gown. I hope you come to supper. You'll pay me all together. Will I live? Go with her, with her. Oh. Hook on, hook on. Will you have dog tears sheet me to supper? No more words. Let's have her. I've heard better news. Uh, what's the news, my good lord? Where lay the king last night? At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope, my lord, all's well. Uh, what is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back? No. Uh, 1,500 foot, 500 horse are marched up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the Archbishop. Uh, uh, comes the king back from Wales, my noble lord? You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good master Gower. My lord. What's the matter? Master Gower. Shall I entreat you with me to dinner? I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you're to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower, if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. <laughs> no, the lord like thee. Thou art a great fool. Before God, I am exceeding weary. Does it come to that? I thought weariness durst not have attached one of so high blood. Faith, it doth me, though it discolours the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Be like then, my appetite was not princely got. For in troth, I do now remember the poor creature, small beer. 
<laughs> but indeed, these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast, very literate these, and those that were thy peach-colored ones, or to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and one other for use. But that the tennis court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keepest not racket there, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of thy low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland. And God knows whether those that ball out the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault whereupon the world increases and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows. After you have labored so hard, you should talk so idly. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, how many good young princes would do so? Their father's lying so sick as yours is. Shall I tell thee one thing, Pons? Yes, Faith. And let it be an excellent good thing. It shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. So, too, I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell. Mary, I tell thee it is not meet that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell to thee, as to one it pleases me for fault of a better to call my friend, I could be sad, and sad indeed, too. Very hardly, upon such a subject. <laughs> By this hand, thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou, and Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Let the end try the man. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. And keeping such vile company as thou art, hath in reason taken from me all ostentation of sorrow. For reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. Every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what excites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why? Because you've been so lewd and so much engraft to Falstaff. And to thee. By this light I'm well spoke on. I can hear it with my own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I'm a second brother and that I'm a proper fellow of my hands. And those two things I confess I cannot help. By the mass, here comes Bardolph. And the boy that I gave Falstaff. He had him from me Christian and see if the fat villain have not transformed him ape. God save your grace. And yours, most noble Bardolph. Come, you pernicious ass, you bashful fool, must you be blushing? Wherefore blush you now? What a maidenly men at arms are you become? Is it such a matter to get a pottle pot's maidenhead? He called me even now, my lord, through a red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. At last I spied his eyes, and me thought he had made two holes in the alewife's new petticoat and peeped through. That's <laughs> what the boy profited. Away, you old snuff -right rabbit, away. Away, you rascally Althea's dream, away. <laughs> Instructor's boy, what dream boy? Marry, my lord, Althea dreamed she was delivered of a firebrand, and therefore I call him her dream. A crown's worth of good interpretation. There it is, boy. Oh, that this good blossom could be kept from cankers. Well, there is sixpence to preserve thee. Oh, if you do not make him be hanged among you, the gallows shall be wronged. And how doth thy master, Bardolph? Oh, well, my lord, you heard of your graces coming to town. There's a letter for you. Delivered with good respect. And how doth the mortal mass, your master? In bodily health, sir. Marry, the immortal part needs a position, but that moves not him. Though that be sick, it dies not. I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place. For look you how he writes. John Falstaff, knight. Every man must know that as oft as he hath occasion to name himself. Even like those that are kin to the king, for they never prick their finger, but they say, there is some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that, says he, that takes upon him not to conceive? The answer is as ready as a borrowed cap. I am the king's poor cousins. Nay, they will be kin to us, but they will fetch it from Jaffet. But to the letter. Sir John Falstaff, knight, to the son of the king nearest his father, Harry, Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Please. I will imitate the honorable Romans in brevity. Sure, he means brevity in breath, short-winded. I commend me to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with poins, for he misuses thy favor so much 
that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Mm -hmm. Repent at idle times as thou mayest, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say as thou usest him. Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. My lord, I'll steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. That's to make him eat twenty of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? God send the wench no worse fortune, but I never said so. Now, thus we play the fools with the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? Yes, my lord. Where sops he? Doth the old boar feed in the old frank? At the old place, my lord, in East Cheap. What company? Ephesians, my lord, of the old church. Sop any women with him? None, my lord, but old Mistress Quickly and Mistress Doll Tearsheet. <laughs> what pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master's. Even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> Shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? I am your shadow, my lord. I'll follow you. Sir, you boy and Bardolph, no word to your master that I'm yet in town. Mm -hmm. uh, as for your sign -offs. Oh, I have no tongue, sir. And for mine, sir, I will govern it. Very well, go. This dull tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you, as common as the way between St. Albans and London. How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colours, and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jerkins and aprons, and wait upon him at his table like drawers. From a god to a bull. <laughs> a heavy declension. It was Jove's case. From a prince to a prince. A low transformation. That shall be mine. For in everything, the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. I, pretty loving wife and gentle daughter, give even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times, and be like them to Percy, troublesome. I have given over. I will speak no more. Do what you will, your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honor is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not to these wars. The time was, Father, when you broke your word, when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy, when my heart, dear Harry, through many a northward looked to see his father bring up his powers. But he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours, the God of heaven brightened it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven. And by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass, wherein the noble youth did dress themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, and speaking thick which nature made his blemish became the accents of the valiant. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him, so that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of delight, in military rules, humours of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh wondrous him, oh miracle of men, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Hotspur's name did seem defensible. So you left him. Never, oh, never do his ghost the wrong to hold your honor more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone. The marshal and the archbishop are strong. Had my sweet Harry had but half their numbers, today might I, hanging on Hotspur's neck, have talked of Monmouth's grave. Oh, beshrew your heart, fair daughter, you do draw my spirits from me with new, lamenting, ancient oversights. But I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. Oh, fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armoured commons have of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground and vantage of the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son. He was so suffered, so came I a widow. Never shall have length of life enough to rain upon remembrance with mine eyes, that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven, 
for recordation to my noble husband. Come, come, go in with me. Tis with my mind as with the tide, swelled up unto his height, that makes us still stand, running neither way. Fain would I go to meet the Archbishop, but many thousand reasons hold me back. Uh, I will resolve for Scotland. There am I, till time and vantage crave my company. What the devil hast thou brought there? Apple John's? Thou knowest Sir John cannot endure an Apple John. Mass, thou sayest true. The prince once set a dish of Apple John's before him and told him there were five more Sir John's, and putting off his hat said, I will now take my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered knights. <laughs> it angered him to the heart, but he had forgot that. Why then, cover and set them down, and uh, see if thou canst find out Sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain have some music. A dispatch. The room where they supped is too hot. They'll come in straight. Sirrah, here will be the prince and Master Poinsonon, and they will put on two of our jerkins and aprons, and Sir John must not know of it. Bardolph hath brought word. By the mess, here will be old Utis. <laughs> it will be an excellent strategy. I'll see if I can find out, Sneak. If faith, sweetheart, methinks now you are in an excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as heart would desire. And your colour, I warrant you, is as red as any rose in good truth, Clark. But ye faith, you've drunk too much canaries, and that's a marvellous searching wine. And it perfumes the blood, and one can say, what's this? How do you now? Better than I was. <laughs> Why, that was well said. A good heart's worth gold. Look, here comes Sir John. Well, the first in court. Empty the Jordan, and was a worthy king. How oh, now, Mistress Doll? Sick of a calm, yea, good faith. So is all her sect. If they be once in a calm, they're sick. <laughs> you muddy rascal. Is that all the comfort you give me? You make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. I Dahl. make them gluttony, and diseases makes them. I make them not. <laughs> if the cook make the gluttony, you help to make the diseases, Doll. We catch of you, Doll. We catch of you. Grant that, my poor virtue, grant that. I marry our chains and our jewels. Your brooches, pearls and ooches. For to serve bravely is to come halting off. You know, to come off the breach with his pike bent bravely and to surgery bravely, to venture upon the charged chambers bravely. Hang yourself, you muddy conger, hang yourself. By my truth, this is the old fashion. You two never meet but you fall to some discord. You're both in good truth as rheumatic as two dry toasts. You cannot bear with another's confirmities. What the good year one must bear, and that must be you. You are the weaker vessel, as they say, the emptier vessel. Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge, full hogshead? And does our old merchant's venture of Bordeaux stuff on him? <laughs> You've not seen a hulk better stuffed in the hold. <laughs> Come, my dear friend, little Jack. Without going to the wars. And whether I shall ever see thee again or no, there's nobody cares. Sir, ancient pistols below and would speak with you. Hang him, swaggering rascal. Let him not come hither. It's the foul mouthed rogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. No, by my faith, I must live among my neighbours. I know swaggerers. I am in good name and fame with the very best. Shut the door. There comes no swaggerers here. I've not lived all this while to have swaggery now. Shut the door, I pray you. Dost thou hear, hostess? Pray you pacify yourself, Sir John. There comes no swaggerous here. Dost thou hear? It is mine ancient. Tell me, Fally, Sir John, ne'er tell me. Your ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tissick, the deputy, the other day. And as he said to me, it was no longer ago the wind's still asked, he good faith. Neighbour quickly, says he. Master Dumby, our minister, was by then. Neighbour quickly, says he, receive those that are civil. For, said he, you are in an ill name. Now, he said so, I can tell whereupon. For, said he, you are an honest woman and well thought on. Therefore, take heed what guests you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. There comes none here. You would bless you to hear what he said. No, are no swaggerers. He's no swaggerer, hostess. A tame cheater, he faith. You may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. 
He'll not swagger with a Barbary hen if her feathers turn back at any show of resistance. Call him up, drawer. Cheater, call you him. I will bar no honest man in my house, nor no cheater. But I do not love swaggering by my troth. I'm the worst when one says swagger. Feel, monsters, how I shake. Look you, I warrant you. So you do, Oasters. Do I? Yea, in very truth do I. If it were an aspen leaf, I cannot abide swaggerers. God save you, Sir John. Welcome, ancient pistol. Here, pistol, I charge you with a cup of sack. Do you discharge upon mine hostess? I will discharge upon her, Sir John, with two bullets. Ah, she is pistol proof, sir. You shall hardly offend her. Oh. Come, I'll drink no proofs nor no bullets. I'll drink no more than will do me good for no man's pleasure, I. Then to you, Mistress Dorothy, I will charge you. Charge me? Well, I scorn you, scurvy companion. What? You poor, base, rascally, cheating, lack linen mate. Away, you mouldy rogue, away. I am meat for your master. I know you, Mistress Dorothy. Away, you cutpurt rascal, you filthy bung, away. By this wine I'll thrust my knife in your mouldy chaps if you play the saucy cuttle with me. Away, you bottle ale rascal, you basket hill stale juggler, you. Since when, I pray you, sir? <laughs> God's light, with two points on your shoulder. <laughs> Much. God, let me not live, but I will murder your wrath for this. No more, Pistol. I would not have you go off here. Discharge yourself of our company, Pistol. Oh, no, good Captain Pistol. Not here, sweet Cap. Captain? Captain? Oh, thou abominable damn cheater. Art thou not ashamed to be called Captain? If captains were of my mind, they would trudge you out for taking their names upon you before you have earned them. You a captain? Oh, you slave? For what? For tearing a poor horse rough in a bawdy house? He a captain? Hang him, rogue. He lived upon mouldy stewed prunes and dried cakes. A captain? God's light. These villains will make the word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was ill-sorted. Therefore, captains need look to it. Pray thee, go down, good ancient. Hark thee hither, Mistress Doll. Not I. I tell thee what, Corporal Bardolph, I could tear her. I'll be revenged on her. Oh, pray thee, go down. I'll see her damned first. To Pluto's damned late by this hand, to the infernal deep, uh, with Erebus and tortures vile also. Hold, hook and line, say I. Down. Down, dogs, down, pigs, have we not iron ya? Oh, good Captain Peace, be quiet. It is very late, ye faith. I beseech you now, aggravate your collar. These be good humours, indeed. Shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but thirty miles a day, compare with Caesar and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks? Nay, rather damn them with King Cerberus, and let the welkin roar. Shall we fall foul for toys? And the truth, Captain, these are very bitter words. Be gone, good ancient. This will grow to a brawl anon. Die oh. men like dogs give crowns like fins. Yes. Have we not iron the arm? My word, Captain, there's none such here. What the good year do you think I would deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. Then feed and be fat, my fair Colipolis. Come, give me some sack. <sighs> si fortuna me tormente, sperato me contente. Fear me broadsides, now let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack, and sweetheart, lie down there. Come we to full points here, and our et cetera's nothing. <laughs> Would be quiet. Sweet knight, I kiss thy knee. What? We have seen the seven stars. Oh, for God's sake, thrust him downstairs. <laughs> I cannot endure such a fustian rascal. Thrust him downstairs? Know we not Galloway eggs? Coit him down, Bardolph, like a shove groat shilling. Nay, and if you do nothing but speak nothing, he shall be nothing here. Come get you downstairs. What? Shall we have incision? Shall we embrue? Oh. Then death rock me asleep. 
abridge my dull crudels. Why then, let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine to the sisters three. Come, Atropos, I say. Here's good oh. stuff to all. Give me my rapier, boy. I pray Jack, I pray do not draw. Get you downstairs. Oh, here's a goodly tune. I was swacking the house before I leave this tenant some lights. So, further I have him now. And I shall have put up your naked weapon. Put up your naked weapon. My pretty Jack, be quiet. The rascal's gone. Ah, you horse and little valiant villain, you. Are you not hurt at the groin? He thought he made a shrewd thrust at your belly. Have you turned him out of doors? Yes, the rascal's drunk. Uh, you have hurt him, sir, in the shoulder. A rascal to brave me. Ah, uh, you sweet little rogue, uh, you. Alas, poor egg, uh, how thou sweatest. Uh, the, Come, let me wipe thy face. Uh, no. Come on, you uh, horse and uh, chops. Uh, ah, rogue, you uh, faith, I love uh, thee. Uh, thou art as valorous as Hector of Troy, uh, worth five of Agamemnon. Uh, and ten times better than the nine worthies. Uh, ah, villain. Oh, rascal slave, I'll toss the rogue in a blanket. Do, and if thou darest for thy heart, and if thou uh, dost, I'll canvas thee between a pair of sheets. The music is come, sir. Let them play. Play, sirs. Sit on my knee, doll. Rascal, bragging slave. Oh, the rogue fled from me like quicksilver. In your face, and thou followest him like a church. Oh, thou horse and little tidy Bartholomew you boar pig. When wilt thou leave fighting a days and foining a nights and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Please, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Sarah. What humours the prince of? <laughs> oh, you good shallow young fellow. You would have made a good pantler. We would have chipped bread well. They say poins hath a good wit. He? A good wit? Oh, hang him, baboon. His wit is as thick as Tewkesbury mustard. There's no more conceit in him than there's no mallet. Why doth the prince love him so then? Because their legs are both of a bigness. And he plays it quite swell. And eats conger and fennel, and drinks off candle ends for flap dragons, and rides the wild mare with the boys, and jumps upon join the stools, and swears with a good grace, and wears his boots very smooth, like unto the sign of the leg, and breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories, and such other gamble faculties he hath that show a weak mind and an able body, for the which the prince admits him. For the prince himself is such another. The weight of an hair will turn the scales between their avoir du poids. Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Let us beat him before his whore. Look, if the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Kiss me, doll. Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? And look whether the fiery trigon is man be not lisping to his master's old tables, his notebook, his council keeper. Thou dost give me flattering buses. By my troth, I kiss thee with a most constant heart. Oh, I am old, I am old. I love thee better than I love a scurvy young boy of them all. What stuff will thou have a kirtle of? Hmm? I shall receive money on Thursday. Thou shalt have a cap tomorrow. A merry song, come. It grows late, we will to bed. Uh, thou wilt forget me when I'm gone. By my troth, thou'll set me a weeping if thou sayest so. Prove that ever I dressed myself handsome till thy return. Well, hearken the end. Some sack, Francis. And all and all, sir. sir. <laughs> ah, <laughs> bastard son of the kings. And art not thou Poins, his brother? Why, thou globe of sinful continence, what a life dost thou lead? A better than thou. I am a gentleman. Thou art a drawer. Very true, sir, and I come to draw you out by the ears. Oh, the Lord preserve thy good grace. By my troth, welcome to London. Now the Lord bless that sweet face of thine. 
Oh, jeez, you, you come from Wales. Thou whores and mad compound of majesty. By this light flesh and corrupt blood, thou art welcome. Oh, you fat fool, I scorn you. My lord, he will drive you out of your revenge and turn all to a merriment if you take not the heat. You horse and candle, mine, you. How vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? God's blessing on your good heart. And so she is, by my troth. Didst thou hear me? Yes, and you knew me as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. You knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I, I, I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse, Hal, on mine honour, no abuse. Use. Not to dispraise me and call me pantler and uh, bread chopper and I know not uh, what. No abuse, Hal. No abuse. No abuse, Ned, in the world. Honest Ned, none. <laughs> I dispraised him before the wicked, that the wicked might not fall in love with him. In which doing I've done the part of a careful friend and a true subject. And thy father is to give me thanks for it. No abuse, Hal. None, none. No faith, boys, none. See, you know, with a pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Or is the boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolph, whose zeal burns in his nose of the wicked? Answer, thou dead elm. Answer. The fiend hath pricked down Bardolph irrecoverable, and his face is Lucifer's privy kitchen where he does nothing but roast malt worms. For the boy, uh, there's a good angel about him, but the devil outbids him too. For the women. For one of them, she is in hell already and burns poor souls. For the other, I owe her money. And whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warrant you. No, I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there is another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house, contrary to the law, for the which I think thou wilt howl. All victuals do so. What is a joint of mutton or two in a whole length? You, gentlewoman. What says your grace? His grace is that which his flesh rebels against. Who knocks alone at the door? Look to the door there, Francis. Peter, how now, what news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are 20 weak and weary posts come from the north. And as I came along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking everyone for Sir John Forstar. Mm -hmm. My heaven points, I feel me much to blame so idly to profane the precious time, when tempest of commotion like the south born with black vapour doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare, unarmed heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Forstaff! Good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night, and we must hence and leave it unpicked. Oh, more knocking at the door. How now? What's the matter? You must away to court, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. Pay the musicians, sir. Farewell, hostess. Farewell, doll. You see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. The undeserver may sleep when the man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. Oh, I cannot speak if my heart be not ready to burst. Well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell, farewell. Well, fare thee well. I have known thee these 29 years come Piscot time, but an honester and truer hearted man. Well, fare thee well. Mistress Tearsheet! Oh, what's the matter? Bid Mistress Tearsheet come to me, master. Oh, run, doll, run. Run, good doll. Oh. Yeah, will you come, doll? Yes. Yeah. Yeah.